Uh, so I'm very excited to uh, welcome Global Fest co-director, co-curator, founder, um, everything, Isabel Soper. Thank you, Ian. That's so not true. Wavelengths is a big collaboration and I'm just a small part of it. So don't even go there. Um, it's really, um, it's really great to be able to come to this part of the Wavelengths um, conference. And I'm coming to you from upstate New York on Muncie, Lenape, and Mohican land. And thank you so much for being with us, um, for sticking with us. Uh, this is our fifth award ceremony. It was created to celebrate extraordinary people and organizations in our unique, wonderful global music field who work so hard um, for work that is primarily, for work that's primarily takes place in the United States. Um, so many in the field go under recognized and this is Global Fest's way of thanking them, appreciating them and recognizing um, all that they do and also inspiring the next generation of leaders who are committed to global culture um, the awards um, go, the, the process for the awards, it's an open nomination process. And anyone who works in the arts, past or present, can make up to three nominations um, in the impact artist or trouble worldwide categories. And our fourth category is the Pioneer Award, which is directly through the Global Fest co-directors. Um, the other three categories are decided by a jury of diverse peers and not by Globefest. Um, we'd like to sincerely thank this year's jury panel. This is an extremely difficult task um, that we ask people to do each year. They are sensitive and thoughtful, um, inspirational. It's really um, difficult decisions that are made um, each and every year. And I'd like to thank from the bottom of my heart, uh, Mehmet Dede, Lisa Stafford, Sean Choi, Paula Breu, and Ishmael Ahmed for their insight and decision-making. So thank you guys all so much. Um, and thanks to all of the people, whether they're here or not, for participating in the award nomination process. Um, we really do receive so many inspiring nominations. Um, and um, well, let's, let's get started. Um, the Pioneer Award goes to a member of the global music community, including performing arts professionals, artist groups, organizations, uh, living or working substantially in the US who are considered a pioneer um, whose work has been deeply felt and has had a significant impact in the world. Previous honorees were Ishmael Ahmed, and Lee Williams. Um, the Pioneer Award we've, is, is a newer award. Um, the other awards have been going on for the last four years. This is the fifth year. Um, I'd like to turn things over to Matteo uh, Mokehi to present the Pioneer Award to Catalina Maria Johnson. Matteo is a native of Chicago. He is currently and newly the Deputy Executive Director of the International Latino Cultural Center in Chicago. Um, you may know him from his groundbreaking work at the Old Town School of Music in Chicago, where he worked for many years. Congratulations, Mateo, and I leave it to you to introduce the Pioneer Award. Thank you, Isabel. I first met Catalina Maria Johnson in the fall of 1988 at a concert with Nigerian artist Sonny Okusan in St. Louis. Catalina was a St. Louis native and I was a transplant from Chicago. We connected immediately over our shared Mexican-American heritage, love of language, and critically, international music. We became fast friends. We soon found ourselves hosting the only Spanish language radio shows in St. Louis at the time at public radio station KDHX. Catalina's show, Onda Latina, explored the breadth of Latin music and showed not only her keen taste in music, but her insight and interest in the origins and stories behind the music through her commentary. This set her on the path to the current day, where she enjoys international recognition for her work as a music journalist. Following her graduate studies, Dr. Catalina Johnson moved to Chicago 
and our paths coincided again in 2006 when I took a job in Chicago. Catalina and I made our first sojourn together to Womix in Sevilla in that year. That trip was pivotal as well. Catalina turned to me at one point in that trip and said, Mateo, I found my tribe. Catalina's list of accomplishments is long. Besides KDHX, Catalina worked as a radio host for WBEZ, Chicago Public Media, Radio Arte, National Mexican Museum of Art, Vocalo, Chicago Public Media, Código, CDMX Radio Cultural en Línea, and Multicult.fm online in Berlin. Her show Beat Latino has been syndicated since 2010 and airs in U.S. cities from Ohio to Alaska to Florida on public and community radio stations. She's a contributor to NPR Music through Culture Desk and Alt Latino. And specifically as a writer, she worked for many years at arts and literature magazine Contratiempo and has written numerous music and culture related articles for Songlines, Billboard, The Chicago Reader, and Downbeat. Catalina's love and appreciation for music shines through all of her work, and she has had an enormous positive impact on the international music community. For these reasons and more, it is my privilege and honor to present the 2022 Global Fest Pioneer Award to Dr. Catalina Maria Johnson. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Mateo, for those really kind words. And thank you, Global Fest, Isabel, Shanta, Bill, for bringing us together to celebrate accomplishments and find the future in our continued support of each other. It's an enormous honor to be a part of this extraordinary cohort of members of the global community who are being celebrated. And it's a treat to see all these wonderful smiling faces. Zoom may not have many advantages, but at least we get to see everybody's smiles. There is one smile I am missing, and that is my mom. She left us this summer. She was a brilliant pionera, a Mexican woman who was sent to the US to study in the 50s and got a PhD, the first Doctora Johnson. Met my dad, that's the Johnson in case you are wondering. She was number one and way ahead of the curve in more time, in more ways than I have time to share. And she would have been here, she'd have been one of these little squares, likely forgetting to mute, probably saying Viva Mexico every now and then. So from these extraordinary human beings and academics who ushered me into the world as a budding academic myself, I don't think I could have ever imagined at the end of the 80s, having a very good collection in vinyl and cassettes at the time of Latin music, that taking the opportunity to share my passion at KDHX in St. Louis would lead me here today. Thinking about how to format the show at the time, I was deeply inspired by another show that was airing, Afropop Worldwide. So it's a particular honor for me to share this space with Banning and Sean. I was so inspired at how carefully and respectfully Afropop Worldwide contextualized what they shared. It's been my desire and deep commitment since then to share and contextualize the music of artists who connect the dots between generations, genres, nations, and peoples, and to the best of my ability, most importantly, artists who illuminate forgotten or neglected stories that are found in the music. Just to share a few examples, I've shared Chicanex folk music that illuminates how Mexico lost two thirds of its territory after it abolished slavery in 1828, decades before the US having annexed Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California, went to war over not doing that. I've also highlighted some of my favorite Ladino music, Judeo-Iberian music, the music of the peoples that were expulsed from their beloved Sephirod, the Iberian Peninsula. And in more recent years, done my very best to share First Nations voices, all the amazing music created by First Nations artists from around the world, including my dad's Sweden, where his dad, Johan Johansson, emigrated from, the Sami people. So coming from all of this hybridity, what a joy, as Mateo said, and this is true. I was like, my tribe, where have I been all my life to have found 
This community of global music makers, movers, shakers, doers, producers, presenters, artists, the entire press, Marco Werman, everybody who was so open to delving into music and complexity and nuance and to also consider it part of a truly a larger social justice movement. And what a joy to have been welcomed to this community. Really the person that got me, introduced me to, I can't tell you how many people, the very person who inspired these awards, Alex Noba, the very first Trouble Worldwide, famously photographed for hugging a disco ball and so says legend, carrying it around saying, you always have to have a disco ball to have a party. So we gave these out at the Women of the World Memorial at Womex a few, back, a few years back in honor of Alex and I travel with it. So I was a bit stuck on what to say today. And uh, two of my music friends uh, said to say, I'm blessed. I'm saying that takes two seconds. I have four minutes, but they were right. They were right to Alex to the partying that matters in this world, to the revelatory transformative power of music, to the magnificent work that everyone here does. Viva, I am blessed, gracias. Congratulations, Catalina. And it is so well deserved. Felicidades. And um, well, it's time for the next um, award. Uh, it's the Impact Award. Uh, this award goes to a professional, whether they be an artist, a group, an organization, or other. Um, any stage who's earned the respect and praise from the global music community for their outstanding commitment to the field. Our previous honorees have been Serdar Ilhan and Mehmet Dede at Drum, Tom Schnabel, Leanne Hahn, and Michael Orlov. And this year, it's Afro Pop Worldwide. And now I'd like to turn things over to the great artist, Eric Wainaina. Um, Eric is a Kenyan singer-songwriter. His career was launched with his album, Sawa Sawa. You might know it. Uh, that was in 2001. His music is a blend of traditional Kenyan music, um, with modern influences. Um, he's also a graduate of Berkeley College of Music. And uh, Eric, take it away. In 1985, Sean Barlow used his summer earnings from working the Alaska fishing industry to travel to West and Central Africa, collecting music and interviewing musicians so he could pitch the Corporation for Public Broadcasting on a 13-part series on contemporary African music. The CPB bit, but wanted a full year of 52 shows instead. In 1987, he and Banning Air returned to the continent and gathered more material for what became the debut of Afropop on public radio in 1988, with a legendary French Cameroonian broadcaster, Georges Collinet, as host. 34 years later, the core team is still at it, having survived wars, recessions, political upheavals, and a pandemic. In 1990, the program expanded its reach to the diaspora as Afropop Worldwide. From 2003 to 2017, the program received 11 National Endowment of the Humanities grants, a record, to produce over 100 Hip Deep episodes using music to explore topics of history, religion, politics, and social change. The program has also received National Endowment of the Arts grants in every year of its existence. In 2015, the program received the Peabody Institutional Award for its 26-year body of outstanding broadcasting and web content. Afropop Worldwide pioneered the establishment of African music in the American media landscape, became one of the first public radio programs to have a website in 1997, and remains one of the longest running nationally syndicated programs in public radio history. Along the way, Barlow and Air have collectively published four books, produced a film on the 2003 festival in the desert in Mali, and aided, advised, and mentored artists, producers, writers, filmmakers, 
presenters and colleagues in countless endeavors supporting and promoting global music. I'm a huge fan. Congratulations, Afropop Worldwide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. You are a true friend. Um, first, on behalf of the whole Afropop team, what an honor to be recognized by our peers, <laughs> the people who know best the challenge of introducing far-flung musics and culture to a nation that is sated with media, distracted easily, and often indifferent to what lies beyond our own borders. The Global Fest community is a treasure. Today has been awesome. And by the way, we particularly enjoyed having Molly and Columbia and Kurdistan provide the music for uh, Sean's recent birthday. That was very nice. It's also really wonderful to be honored alongside Simone Shaheen, one of our favorite musicians to hear and interview over the years. And also Catalina, thank you very much for those kind words. As Eric said, Afropop began with the vision of a curious young man who used money he'd earned in the Alaska fishing industry to travel to Africa with his microphones and camera. He was so excited by the music that was keeping the dance bars of Kinshasa, Douala, and Accra a boil that he returned determined to make those sounds known in America. He was very lucky to meet a slightly older gentleman who had spent years at the center of the boiling African music scene in Paris. It was really the combined visions of Sean Barlow and George Collinet that sparked the blazing glory that is Afropop worldwide today. As for me, I was an aspiring novelist, guitar player, and songwriter when Sean turned me on to, took me to the Congo, South Africa, and Zimbabwe in 1987. But once aboard the Afropop train, there really was no getting off. <laughs> and here I am. Afropop really was the first nationally syndicated broadcast to focus solely on African diaspora music. Artists from Yusuf Dor to Cesaria Evera and Anjali Kijo found their first national platform on our airwaves. And our work has genuinely paved the way for the massive explosion of music out of Nigeria that today is edging into the black music mainstream, finally. <laughs> there are so many people to thank that who deserve thanks for this great honor you've bestowed on us. Uh, starting, of course, with the artists who invited us into their worlds to share their stories and music with the Afropop community around the world. Also, NPR, PRI, and now PRX, the distributors who believed in us over the years. And of course, all our public radio stations, our generous financial supporters, and our listeners. I'll mention two long haulers in the Afropop team. Ned Sublet, a producer of brilliant programs from the earliest days to the present. Ned has been our muse and our guru every step of the way. The other is our peerless chief audio engineer, Michael Jones, who long ago perfected the art of turning whatever audio we put before him, however technically challenging, into luminous hours of programming. What's more, He's taught a series of protégés to do the job when he's off on his own global adventures. I also want to thank our network of producers, journalists, and scholars around the world, and also three pillars of the current Afropop team. Ben Richmond, our director of new media and operations, which is a nice way of saying one guy doing three jobs. Also, Lynn Jones, our bookkeeper, and Cece Smith, our editor-at-large. Very honored to have those guys on the team, too. So maybe the thing that's really kept us going all these years is our shared sense that connecting Americans to Africa in the present is vital to understanding our own past and, our, and also charting our, our future. In today's national discussion, this task has become newly combative. But Afropop has consistently demonstrated that embracing the African legacy in America need not be a, a, a slog through horror and guilt. It can just as well be accomplished through thrilling narratives and joyous music. In fact, more effectively, I would say. 
So much has changed since we began over 35 years ago. Media, our political culture, Africa's burgeoning African diaspora population, many communities, and of course, the music itself. As we accept this recognition, we have one overriding message. Afropop worldwide must succeed us. It must survive us. We need young leaders with the vision to build on what we've done and to re retrofit it for times and challenges to come because the job is not over. <laughs> this is going to take leaders with the skills to grow Afropop's reach beyond its current demographic, beyond all the folks who are here, much as we love you, there's a great world out there that needs to, needs to be turned on to all of this history and music. Um, you know, when I think about all we've accomplished in 34 years on the air, we can't help but imagine what would be possible if this organization were better funded to begin with, but also headed by a young, diverse team that's as talented and fired up as we all were three decades ago. The Afropop mission is central to what our beleaguered president likes to call the soul of America. It's too important to simply archive and call it a day. America needs Afropop. The world needs Afropop. So we thank you for this honor. We love you all. And long live Afropop. You can find us on afropop.org. Thank you, Georgia. You got the message. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, really, just, oh, yes. Ours is in the fridge. <laughs> Mm. To you all. Cheers. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if if, if uh, I'll take over. <laughs> I don't want to say hello, but <laughs> I hogged the stage here. Um, Sean or George, were you saying anything or? Well, you know, I'm talking about about this uh, this bottle here of champagne. It's not champagne prosecco. Anyway, uh, the thing is, I would, one anecdote that, that I really love is when we started this whole adventure, I call it, uh, way back when thirty what five, Manning six, yeah. gone. Yeah, uh, I used to say, okay, I'll buy a, if we survive one week, I will buy a bottle of champagne. And then we pass, and on one month, I buy two bottles of champagne if we survive two months. And it went on, and today, you know what? I can't afford to buy champagne <laughs> the region of, in, in Paris, in France, I mean, because we have succeeded beyond all expectations, I must say. And rightly so, I mean, we have this team, I mean, look at this, the, 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 the one that you presented, Banning, they are excellent people. Everybody is really putting his heart and, you know, it's like a, a, a clock. You make all these little gears work perfectly. And that's what happened. And that's what made this amazing program shine. That's what I can say. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Oh, no, that's not, that's not African. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this honor. John, did you have a, ah, you're muted. Um, I think our team can unmute you or you can unmute. Oh. There you are. You need the microphone. Can someone on our team unmute, Sean? Okay. Here we go. There you go. Okay, technology 101, here we go. Um, well, just, I'd love to, to say what an honor it is to be here today and uh, to receive the, this award from our colleagues and our peers and our fellow travelers from Global Fest. Um, you guys are the greatest and have created a, a, a wonderful organization that we all take great pride in. So thank you, uh, Isabel. Thank you, Shanta. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Ian and Catherine, for all your hard work in, in putting this together and, and, and the whole 
uh, Global Fest endeavor. I can remember being just blown away by the concerts, the Global Fest concerts in New York in, in January in years past. And I just look forward to the return of that. Yeah. And, and um, I'm sure you do too. And uh, also just a, a big thanks to our team again, to George and uh, uh, Banning and to Ben and to our international crew of reporters and, and producers who support the show and contribute to the show and to Lynn and to Cece. You guys are the greatest and uh, we couldn't do this without you. So here, here, cheers. Thank you. I want to live Afropop. <laughs> to you guys congratulations again for all that you're all three here with us and um and thanks for all that you do and for putting out the call for the next generation um you're amazing and it's well deserved and uh, i am going to move forward now with our next uh category um or the worldwide award um this award is named after Alex Nova. Um, you heard Catalina mention her name. Um, she brought a tireless, joyful uh, energy. Um, she brought people together. She left an indelible mark in this field. She's incredibly missed. She will always be missed. Um, and this award is presented to an industry professional who exemplifies that spirit. And um, the previous honorees for this award were Alison Lurkey, Lisa Stafford, Matthew Covey and Tamizdat, and um, posthumously, sadly, Alex Nova in 2018. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Matthew Covey uh, to present the Trouble World wide award to the Artistic Freedom Initiative. Um, Matt and Tommy Stott don't need much of an intro here. Um, they've been connected to Global Fest from its beginning, um, have done an incredible service to our field. And we are thrilled that you, Matthew, will be presenting this award to um, AFI. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, Matthew Covey, as you just said, I'm joining from upstate New York on the ancestral lands of the Abenaki people. I pay respect to their elders past and present. Um, as a lot of people know, I'm the executive director of Thomas Dot. We were the recipient in 2019, so it gives me much joy to be able to introduce this year's recipients uh, and to shine a light on the really groundbreaking work that Artistic Freedom Initiative does. As Thomas Dot and AFI have come to work together more and more over the last few years, uh, and have introduced ourselves to each other's worlds. Um, I feel like we've really found in Ashley and Sanjay and the rest of the AFI team, something that's really rare for us lawyers. And that's true colleagues uh, and inspiring and committed comrades. It's been so exciting to work with them and to think and act more deeply and creatively in the intertwined nexus of artist mobility, artist safety and equity in the arts. AFI understands how important international culture is to the broader mission of civil society. And they believe in the tools that the law gives us to further that mission. And that's, that's powerful stuff. Um, it's not something that everybody understands. And I'm really glad there's people out there who do. But also, and I'd say not insignificantly, I know Alex would have heartily approved with all the trouble that AFI is stirring up. And she would have loved dancing with Ashley at the after party. So thank you guys for all you do. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you to everyone. We are just so incredibly honored to, to receive this award, um, to be here among you know, our fellow awardees who are just absolute giants and legends in the field. Well, it's extremely humbling and um, deeply meaningful. Um, 
definitely have to give a special shout out to Matthew, who, you know, some years ago really took me uh, under his wing and, and introduced me to this incredible community of people, um, to so many amazing individuals I've now, you know, had the great fortune to come to know and work alongside. Um, AFI is super lucky to have Matthew in our corner and just can't thank him enough for um, all that he's done to support AFI's mission and work and to, to help our, our work grow together. Um, I also have to thank the Global Fest crew, um, Bill, Isabel, and Shanta. Each of you has been so supportive of AFI's work over the years in so many profoundly significant ways, um, from referring artists to us who may need legal assistance to helping us spread the word about AFI's festivals and concerts and exhibitions to giving us the opportunity to share our work with this community as, as we did today um, and to finally to recognizing our work um, through this Trouble Worldwide Award as, as you all have. It continues to be such an honor to collaborate with you all and um, we just really appreciate you for believing in, in what we do. Um, I also you know have to extend a very heartfelt thank you to the partners and collaborators from this community who are really making our work possible. Um, and of course, you know, Matthew and Boo from Tommy's Daughter at the very top of that list um, and their work with us on our residency program. Same goes for the amazing Alex Knowlton and Isabel Kim from Joe's Pod at the Public Theater. Um, Mira Dougal, Diana Ezrin, Jordana Lee, Nicole Merritt, uh, Jim Thompson, all of these folks um, who have just been so wonderful in um, teaching us kind of, you know, how to be part of this community and how, how we can collaborate together. Um, the folks in the Womex community and um, Mundial Montre uh, Montreal with uh, Derek Andrews and, and Eli Levinson. It's, uh, it's been, for me, one of the greatest joys of, um, of my career to get to know all of you and to get to work with you. Um, you guys have just been so warm and welcoming us to be part of this brilliant, talented enclave of people. Um, you've created space for us to, to share our work, uh, to raise awareness and you've created opportunities for our musicians to showcase their work. You've made commitments to mentor the musicians at risk that we work with um, and offer them a creative community to become a part of um, professional development to help them flourish as artists. So thank you for bringing us into this amazing community um, for your collaboration and commitment and for giving us the opportunity to make a positive impact in this field um, and for honoring us with this award. Um, I would, I'm gonna pass it over to Sanjay uh, now to, to say a few words as well. Thank you all. Thank you everyone. Um, it's a great honor to receive this award uh, and a most special thank you to the SDK Foundation for Human Dignity, uh, which generously provided the foundational funding for AFI and continues to enable AFI to have a meaningful impact on the lives of artists globally. And of course, thank you to AFI's board and staff, uh, which put our offbeat ideas into action. In accepting this award, it's really important for me to acknowledge again, the other organizations working in this space, uh, as Ashley just did. All the NGOs that are dedicated to artistic freedom play a critical part in upholding the rights of artists globally. And unfortunately, given the economic and political disruptions in the world, these rights increasingly need to be promoted, defended, advocated for. And just in the last decade, political polarization, the rise of illiberalism, the return and advancement of authoritarianism have not just affected civil society, but they've changed artistic production. Um, and artists are being restricted in how and where their works can be exhibited and performed Access to public funding and grants have been politicized to a degree that artists are being forced to self-censor in order to professionally survive. And artist communities are being attacked simply for cultivating and presenting alternative viewpoints. Economically, artists have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and deprived of the audiences so often necessary for sustaining one's art. And the uncertainty surrounding arts and cultural funding has increasingly subjected artists to a marketplace that can stifle creativity and reward conformity. If you take our organization's view um, that the ability to create freely without restriction is a distinct human feature, then these global developments are not only an impediment to living in a free and open society, but at their core, they are dehumanizing. 
right now, I'm not sure we can necessarily say that artists today are better off than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. However, simultaneous to these developments, artists themselves have shown great resolve in forming autonomous spaces for creativity and making bold and compelling artistic statements for the cause of advancing social justice. There is not a single contemporary social justice movement where artists have not played a critical role. And in the face of this resolve, we applaud all the artists, individuals, and organizations working to preserve the right to creative and pluralistic expression. And we welcome all socially minded people to join this cause. Thanks again to Global Fest for recognizing our work. It is truly an honor. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to partner with all the participants in this important event to improve global creative freedom. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sanjay and Ashley, and all of the work that you do. It is inspirational, and um, you have your work cut out for you, as you guys know. Um, and I think that we are incredibly lucky to know you and know that, you're, that you do such incredible work um, and that you're so open to you know, meeting people and, and creative ideas and congratulations. Um, I forgot to mention that we have an award actually. It's a really nice award. Um, I didn't bring it down, but you'll actually be getting one of those. It's a, it's a very cute, nice award. Some of you might remember it from last year. Um, I will move on to the last award now. And um, the last award is the Artist Award. Um, this award for sustained achievement goes to an artist or group uh, living or working mostly in the US who's made a lasting impression with their music in the US, their homeland or around the world. Um, whether that's through innovation, activism, dynamism, commitment to, to developing the next generation. This award acknowledges the impacts that artists have at home and abroad. Our previous honorees have been Mick Cleet, Kahan Calhor, Mighty Sparrow or Slinger Francisco, and Thomas Mapfumo. And this year, it's a real honor for us to present this award to Simone Shaheen. Um, Ken Fisher, who is the president emeritus of the um, UMass University Musical Society, um, is probably no stranger to many of you. Um, he has also recently written a memoir detailing his many years at Ann Arbor's UMS. And um, thank you, Ken, so much for presenting this artist award to Simone. I'm honored to present the 2022 Global Fest Artist Award for Sustained Career Achievement to Simone Shaheen. A native Palestinian, Simone began to play the oud at age five, taught by his father, and began violin at age six at the conservatory in Jerusalem. After completing performance and music education degrees in both Jerusalem and New York City, Simone set out on his lifelong commitment to performing the highest standard of traditional Arab music while finding a way of incorporating a variety of other forms. He formed the Near Eastern Music Ensemble in his late 20s, and a few years later launched Kentara, an ensemble of international artists who embrace Simone's vision of unbridled blending of Arabic, jazz improvisation, Western classical, and Latin music, a perfect way for music to transcend the boundaries of genre and geography. Of his many recordings, perhaps his greatest success has come with Blue Flame, a legendary recording with Kentara that has garnered 11 Grammy Awards. He has performed all over the world at the top concert venues and festivals, including performances of his Oud Concerto commissioned by the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, and has numerous film and stage credits for soundtracks and live accompaniments. In 1994, he received the prestigious National Heritage Award from President Clinton at the White House for his contributions to the world of arts. And that's when he was just getting started. <laughs> but one can't talk about Simone without celebrating his commitment to educating people of all ages about Arab music. Beginning in 1994, Simone produced the annual Arab Festival of Arts in New York City that showcased the work 
of the finest Arab artists while presenting the scope, depth, and quality of Arab culture. And since 1997, he's hosted the annual week-long Arabic music retreat at Mount Holyoke College that draws participants from the, UM, UM, from the US and abroad. As a champion and guardian of Arab music, Simone devotes almost 50% of his time offering workshops and lecture demonstrations to schools and universities. Now, one of those universities was the University of Michigan back in the 2003-04 season. It involved a collaboration between Ann Arbor's University Musical Society that I led at the time and Dearborn's Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services that was then led by Ismail Ahmed, recipient of last year's Global Fest Pioneer Award. The collaboration enabled Simone, his international ensemble Kantara, and local Arab musicians to spend nearly two months in residence, splitting time between Ann Arbor and Dearborn. So Simone, what a joy it was to work with you as you brought your unique musical gifts along with your deep humanity, endless generosity and infectious smile to thousands of people in our region. The residency ended with a concert at the packed Michigan Theater in Ann Arbor that included the world premiere of your work, Arboresque, in honor of the residency. So his, for his sustained career achievements in performance, creation, and education, and his worldwide impact in each area, I'm proud to present the 2022 Global Fest Artist Award to my good friend, Simone Shaheen. Thank you, Ken, for this uh, introduction. And uh, I'm really honored to be introduced by you. And I am really humbled to receive this, uh, the Global Fest uh, honor. Uh, it's, uh, it just may make me feel that uh, we have been working together very hard. And uh, in the last 40 years, uh, when I came to United States in 1980, of course, I, w I went to uh, Columbia University, Manhattan School of Music to finish my higher degrees there. But at the same time, I always had in the back of my mind to really reach out to the American Performing Arts Centers, to the universities, to the schools, and uh, introduce uh, music from various parts of the Arab world. And they collaborate with so many artists. And New York City was a dream come through. This is where I collaborated with artists who live in, the, uh, in New York and who pass by New York from different parts of the world. Uh, back to Ken, I, I cannot forget the residency at the University of Michigan, uh, which was also with the, you know, with the help of Ben Johnson and Ismail Ahmed at Access. This was one of the most memorable residencies because it was uh, very well organized. The reach out was amazing and it included so many facets uh, from workshops to master classes to performances to uh, lectures, interviews, radio programs. Uh, visiting hospitals and playing to, <laughs> to uh, uh, you know, uh, people at the hospitals, bedsides, performances. This was very moving and very powerful. And if I want to, uh, uh, if I want to compare, I would say this residency set the tone for all the residencies that I continue to conduct in the United States and abroad, for sure. And. Uh, Doing all this work from performances to residencies to uh, creating projects and programs, collaboration, it, uh, it um, makes me feel that I am at home with Global Fest. Uh, I, I, feel, I feel this like Global Fest is the nutshell of all this work. 
that brings people together, that connects cultures and musics from different parts of the world. And uh, it helps also uh, the, the, the uh, connecting artists together to uh, come up with projects, with music, that otherwise they wouldn't have thought about or didn't, didn't have the thinking of uh, working or infusing their uh, culture, musical cultures, with other cultures. And uh, I really, um, I, I have the utmost respect for what the Global Fest is doing or has been doing. And uh, one of the people at Global Fest, which is Isabel Sofer. I met Isabel in the long, long time ago, uh, uh, even through the World Music Institute and Robert Browning, uh, when we were introducing uh, different parts, uh, different musics from different parts of the world, including uh, music from the Arab world. And uh, we, uh, we did so many concerts together, so many programs and projects together. Uh, not only uh, just pure Arabic traditional music, but as I said before, it was a kind of collaboration uh, cross cultures uh, with so many uh, artists. And the World Music Institute and later the uh, Global Fest there, they were the ground that they, they, that uh, that really nourished uh, this approach to uh, uh, to music, and of course in the United States, I've always felt there was that there was a good uh, reception to different parts of music from different parts of the world. American had the open mind to uh, receive artists from different parts of the world, and. Uh, participate in knowing and understanding and relating to music and cultures in general. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about the American pure, pure people. Because if we want to talk about politics and institutions, political institutions, then we'll go the other way. But uh, my experience with the co different communities in the United States has been so rich so uh, uh, in, in, in enriching and uh, the fact that when I started the, my first concert at uh, the uh, what was the museum in Lower Manhattan, the, uh, it was a very small museum. Uh, I played, there were like 40 or 50 people. And then here I come to Ann Arbor and play a concert <laughs> to maybe 2,000 to 500, 2,500 people. Uh, for me, this is a measurement of uh, the connectivity and the, the willingness on behalf of the artists and the people to work together and uh, uh, with an open mind uh, and uh, nourish uh, music from different parts of the world. And um, the one of the uh, also with the projects that I worked uh, with the uh, with the Global Fest was a project called Zafir. Um, I remember when we uh, played at APAP in New York uh, and introduced, you know, like a short segment of the Zafir to many. Uh, uh, artists and uh, to many agents and uh, institutions and uh, the it was about uh, you know the this connection that many people talk about which is arabic music and the spanish flamenco traditional music and this zafir uh, really embodied this project uh, of uh, bringing arabic music and spanish flamenco and working uh, to to uh, outline the commonalities, if you will, of those different cultures who really, um, these are different musics, but there are so many commonalities, if you think about it. And uh, the, as I said before, reaching out to performing art centers and universities and colleges, and even to schools, elementary schools in New York, 
I remember when I started uh, working on a program with few other artists called Arts Connection in New York City that brings artists to uh, elementary schools and uh, perform in assembly fashion with for three, four hundred uh, students, perform and introduce the music of the region, whether it's from Africa or Asia or from Europe, Eastern Europe, <coughs> uh, Latin American and uh, United States and so forth. And this was a very powerful program. Uh, it, uh, uh, I noticed that whenever I did this kind of assembly with my own group, the Near Eastern Music Ensemble, it connected. It, uh, it uh, connected with the students, even if they were from the third or the fourth or the fifth grade. It connected. They understood the culture, the food, the music, the geographic, and uh, certain features of countries that we always introduce to those students. And they they left, I, they left me. Uh, they left me feeling that uh, th there was a connection there. They 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 learned something, and I learned uh, just by introducing uh, and talking about uh, music from different parts of the world. Uh, I learned from students great deal because they ask questions that I I never thought that I would hear it. Uh, they ask very uh, challenging questions that made me think not once, not twice, but many times. And also, um, uh, Ken, you mentioned uh, the Near Eastern Music Ensemble and Kantara. Uh, they, they were, I mean, they, I, I never worked and say that I, I work by myself. I always worked with many musicians who uh, were fantastic musicians from different parts of the world. And I worked with so many different organizations with so uh, many uh, fantastic people in the business who, uh, who really were, were honest. They, they, were, uh, they were interested. They wanted to uh, reach out and create this, I, I would call it the, the musical globalism, if you will. So, uh, meeting uh, some uh, uh, Arab musicians from uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Syria, uh, uh, Lebanon, Palestine, in New York and in Chicago. And uh, they were, they used to play in the, you know, the scene was the, the nightclub scenes. And these were great musicians. I didn't think that this was their place. And I offered them to move to New York and to start the Near Eastern Music Ensemble, play together. And uh, little by little, the Near Eastern Music Ensemble became a very powerful ensemble that uh, reached so many thousands of American people in the United States. And the purpose was, through the performing arts centers, not only to reach the Arab community, but to reach the larger crowd in the United States. And this was a very successful attempt. With Kantara, it was about this fusion and collaboration with uh, musicians from, uh, from France, from the United States, from Lebanon, from South America. We created this group together and recorded uh, a Blue Flame uh, that was nominated to 11 Grammys, but never got it <laughs> for some reason. I don't know why. And uh, uh, it proved that when uh, musicians, they have the sensibility and the interest to know about the, the other cultures, uh, they will find, again, the word is commonalities. They will find the common ground in which uh, it's, it's a kind of fertile ground that brings uh, fantastic music that otherwise, you know, without trying or experimenting, you will, we will never know. And uh, finally, I, I would say the establishing the uh, Arabic, uh, the Arab, the Arab Arts uh, uh, Festival in uh, in New York at with the collaboration of the Brooklyn Museum and Town Hall in Manhattan, 
uh, was uh, another attempt to uh, bring Arabic music and culture in general, not only music, but also dance, uh, poetry, films, theater, uh, 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 so, so many, many other things I can't remember now, uh, to the general public uh, and uh, in, in the get them to know uh, this kind of art in general uh, and uh, reach out, reach out and let them know about the, about the other cultures that are so powerful, so interesting. And uh, uh, the other thing that uh, uh, I worked with many other people, of course, uh, especially with my friend and colleague, Ali Jihad Rasi, uh, was the Arabic music retreat. With the help of uh, uh, Dr. Rasi and with the help also with a very good friend and colleague, Kay Campbell, we established the Arabic music retreat at Mount Holyoke College. And this is a, a week-long intensive work on Arabic music, uh, from ear training to improvisations to private lessons on instruments, singing, and uh, ensemble playing and orchestra playing. And uh, what's interesting about the retreat that it, reach, uh, it reaches, uh, reached uh, various uh, various types of artists, including performers. It reached uh, um, professors at the university who teach, you know, music, ethnomusicology. It reached uh, performers with the symphony orchestras who came to the retreat to learn about it. Composers, uh, the uh, people interested in education, and each one of those took something from the retreat and introduced it. Uh, in turn to their own uh, community. So this was another uh, fantastic and beautiful uh, work that I really felt that with the co collaboration with so many uh, people around, around me, we all together uh, uh, created a nice work that helped uh, defining the uh, the you know defining Arabic music at large uh, in the United States. Yeah. Uh, also, you know, uh, as you can mention, writing oud concerto that I performed with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra and later on with the Chicago Chamber Orchestra, with Philadelphia, with the Red U Symphony in uh, in uh, Rome, with the Lebanese Philharmonic, the Syrian Philharmonic, and many others, Palestine. Uh, this was another work that uh, at least um, uh, made it made it possible to an instrument like the oud to perform yeah. with a symphonic uh, with symphony orchestra. Uh, of course, uh, the fact that I uh, learned Arabic music with my father and uh, worked on uh, Western classical music on the violin at the conservatories. Uh, this has all helped me understand the sounds, the melodies, the harmonies, the, the nuances of, of, uh, uh, of the orchestras. And uh, I found the commonalities between the sound of the oud and the orchestras. And uh, for me, this was a, a beautiful work uh, and that I was honored to play with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And again, with Ken and Ismail and the Axis and the museum, it wasn't this collective work I would have never played with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, other, uh, other projects, you know, the Imani Winds in New York, where I played, you know, uh, I, I composed for them this quintet, uh, working with artists like Quincy Jones and We Are the Future in Rome, collaboration with Indian musicians, uh, Asians, uh, Eastern European, uh, American musicians like Al Miola and Quincy Jones, Sting from England, uh, Zakir Hussein, uh, Vishwa Mohan Bhatt, and many others. Uh, this was very enriching, and uh, it really, I grew, I grew up 
musically speaking, uh, by collaborating with all these artists. Uh, now I teach at Berkeley. I still con conduct uh, performances, do workshops, but for the last two years, uh, many events have been postponed or canceled due to the uh, health conditions and the COVID. But uh, at Berkeley, uh, I teach music there. And uh, of course, uh, a lot of American students and students from various parts of the world. I helped also uh, bringing to Berkeley uh, young musicians from Palestine, from Lebanon, from Syria, from Turkey, from Iran. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it opened up it opened up the concept of music from different parts of the world at Berkeley. You hear me saying music from different parts of the world and not world music because if you say world music this then it includes Western classical music. And we, when we say Western classical music, also this is something that I oppose because uh, German music and English music and Italian music are different musics. But uh, uh, I, I like the concept of uh, music from different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And this is what uh, uh, happened at Berkeley. Um, I learned so much from all these institutions, from all these people, from my students at Berkeley and outside of Berkeley. And I would like to thank Isabel, Bill and Catherine, Steve Heath and uh, Ken. I cannot thank you enough for this generous introduction. Thank you so much. And I wish the Global Fest all the best now and in the future. Great. Thank you, Shimon. Well, uh, what uh, what better artists than Simone to be to to receive the artist award this year? Um, he's quite modest, actually. He is also a. Um, teacher at Berkeley, he's had a film made about him. I mean, he has done so much for Arabic music and culture um, in the US, but around the world. And, um, and it's really wonderful that we're able to uh, recognize him for all that he's done. And um, I also have the great honor of thanking you all for being with us throughout this wavelength. Um, and I'd like to introduce our guest curator this year, Gabrielle Davenport, who contributed so much to um, the curation of this year's Tiny Desk Meets Global Fest and our original in-person uh, planning. And I think we're gonna raise a toast, right? And I think Bill is also in the house still. Can we get Bill on too? It's such an honor to work with Shanta and Bill and Ian and the office team and to have had Gabrielle as our guest curator this year. And, um, and I think we're raising a toast, right? Indeed, thank you. It's lovely to, to be a part of this wonderful community and it's nice to have a have an excuse to at least see you all on zoom for the foreseeable um, uh, um, every January it's really a treat and a reminder of um, the folks who actually make music fun to work in um, so thank you for having me and uh, for watching tiny desk this year um, and yeah I, I only have water here but cheers <laughs> I have a tea <laughs> The afternoon. We have quite an amazing team, but I'd really like to just thank you all for participating, for being here with us, for spending your whole day, many of you for spending your day with us, and um, for learning together and celebrating such important people in our world.